All right, everybody. We're going to be doing touch and pain today. Uh, so hopefully by now you've already done motor uh, and you've already done the first part of the sensory PowerPoint. Um, this is number two. So the sensory portion in the Brain Facts book is quite long. And so we thought it'd be best to separate them into two different lectures. Now, we talked about the sensory system like sight, uh, smell, uh, hearing, uh, all that stuff, but now we're going to talk about the somatosensory system, which is all about touch, pain, and feel. Okay, so the primary somatosensory cortex is uh, Broadman areas three, one, and two. This is going to be on the parietal lobe. And remember, if you remember from the first lecture we gave on neuroanatomy, the postcentral gyrus, which is on the parietal lobe, which is just behind the central sulcus is going to be where Broadman areas 3, 1, and 2 are located. Okay, so it's the most front part of the parietal lobe, or in anatomical terms, it's the most anterior area of the parietal lobe, um, and it's on the post-central gyrus. Okay, so on our skin, we actually have different types of receptors. These receptors are uh, sensitive to, to pressure, sensitive to vibration, sensitive to heat, uh, temperature stuff, uh, and chemicals as well. Uh, and so this is what allows us to understand the environment around us and the difference between certain objects. So for example, if you touch the table in front of you, you might be feeling on wood or plastic or something like that, and then touch a, a furry pet or a carpet, those textures are very different. And the reason that we can feel the difference is because of the somatosensory system. Now, pain is often associated as a negative thing. But pain is actually really important in understanding uh, if anything's wrong with our body. So there are medical conditions where a person's ability to sense pain uh, are taken away, uh, whether it be from a, an accident or some type of genetic abnormality. Um, a person who doesn't feel pain will often overexert themselves, and that will lead to injuries that they won't even know that they have. Um, so a person may walk up in, into the hospital uh, not feeling any pain, but showing bruising, uh, even just having broken bones and not even feeling it. Uh, so this would obviously not be good. So if you didn't feel pain, it would be very easy to, for example, to uh, box or play football. However, the impact of those sports or the impact of those activities uh, is still going to cause damage even if you do not feel pain. So feeling pain is actually very, very important. So take, for example, your hand and touch something in front of you, whether it's a keyboard on a computer or your cell phone or uh, a bottle of water. Now, whatever you're touching, those signals at your fingertips are going to be sent through your entire arm through sensory nerve fibers. They're going to eventually make their way through the dorsal part of the nerve fiber, uh, uh, something called the dorsal root, and through the dorsal root ganglion. And then from there, it's going to enter the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, depending on the stimulus that it is, right now you're, you're not in any danger, so it's not going to be a reflex, but that signal will travel all the way up through what we call an ascending pathway. Ascending just means to go up or to rise. So that signal is going to go up through your spinal cord. Eventually, it's going to travel to the thalamus. And then in the thalamus, the thalamus will relay that information to the somatosensory cortex, which was, again, the post-central gyrus, Broadman areas 3, 1, and 2. Now, the sensitivity of what you're doing or the sensitivity of your touch and feel actually uh, is dependent on the number of receptors that you have in that area, as well as how often you are exposed to said stimulus. So the more you are exposed to any stimulus, whether it's auditory or visual um, or tactile, uh, the less sensitive you get over time. Uh, this means that, for example, if you're in a really busy room where there's a lot of people talking, there's a lot of noise, but you're trying to have a conversation with someone right in front of you, your brain will automatically ignore everything else and only pay attention to the auditory information coming from the person you're trying to talk to. That's called sensory adaptation. Okay, The more you stimulate a receptor, over time, that receptor is going to get weaker and weaker, or the, the signal uh, that's being sent is going to get weaker and weaker, because the receptors will be less sensitive. Now, 
throughout your body, you will have a different number of receptors depending on where you are. And this is really important as well. So your lips, your fingertips are going to have a lot of receptors. And that's why we like to touch things. If you uh, have ever seen a child, maybe you have a younger brother, sister, uh, nephew or something, niece, nephew, or just know someone who has a child, right? Or remember when you were a child. Kids love to pick stuff up. They love to touch things, even though they're, they shouldn't be, or even when they're not supposed to be. They love to touch and feel things. Um, and that's really important to develop their understanding of the world around them. Um, but the reason they like to touch with their hands and touch with their mouths, put things in their mouths, is because those are the areas that have the most receptors. And so those are the areas that are more sensitive and therefore send the most signal to the brain. Now, there are other areas, for example, uh, the back. Um, so the the part of your back near your vertebrae and, the, for example, you, uh, where your latissimus dorsi and your trapezius are, um, those areas are going to be less sensitive. And that gets us to the point of two-point discrimination. So two-point discrimination is really important because it not only helps us understand the different receptor quantity in specific areas of our body, but it is also a useful tool in diagnosing certain neurological conditions where um, touch, feel, and two-point discrimination are altered because of a car accident or a tumor or uh, a stroke of some sort. So this is really important. So the concept is take your forearm and take two pens. Uh, maybe you could do this with a buddy, but someone, whoever's putting the two pens on the person, one, be gentle, but two, start off with the pens very far apart. It's very easy for the person who's feeling this to know that those pens are far apart, even when they're not looking at it. So the person who is uh, the victim in this case, who's not doing anything with the pens, just holding out their arm, uh, I want you guys to close your eyes. Now, if you can feel two different pens at two different points in your arm, then you're in a good place. If not, move the pens farther away. Now, as you move the pen tips closer and closer and closer together, little by little, the sensation of being able to, to sense whether two things are on the arm it begin, uh, begins to get harder and harder. So at one point, the closer the, uh, if, the, if the pens or pencils are very close together, the person perceiving that sensation may only feel one thing touching them, even though it is two things touching them. If you were to do this on your fingertips, your two-point discrimination would be better meaning that no matter how close two things or two objects are to each other, you're still going to be able to sense them. If you do it to someone's back, you can do this with your fingers, um, their ability to sense two specific points is not as good as the fingertips or the lips. Okay, So that's just the idea of two-point discrimination. And you guys can play around with that little project. Now let's talk about pain. So pain is a warning signal. We already talked about that it's super important and not feeling pain is actually not necessarily a good thing. Um, it, pain is both sensory and emotional, meaning that in your brain, the way that you develop memories, uh, pain plays a really big part in that. So a person who's not, who is born without the ability uh, to feel pain will never really know what it's like to uh, you know, fall off their bike and then not be able to ride their bike because of how bad their legs hurt or something. Um, they will have less issues with doing more severe things or more dangerous things like running a marathon or uh, skydiving or jumping off of the roof into a pool. Because pain is so closely tied with fear, um, a person who doesn't feel pain will feel less fear. They won't be as scared of doing things because they won't know what it's like to get hurt. Um, and so, therefore, pain is also very emotional. It has a lot to do with the limbic system uh, and memory formation uh, via emotions. Um, and this allows us to uh, interpret, especially starting from a young age, what situations are dangerous, what we should and shouldn't be doing, um, like placing your hand on a hot stove. Now, you're, we also have something called nociceptors. So nociceptors are really special sensory fibers, and they respond to certain stimuli that will cause tissue damage. So for example, if we go back to that example of placing your hand on a hot stove, um, those nociceptors will be activated and sense that, that tissue is being damaged and that will send a reflex to your spinal cord 
through the dorsal part and then back through the ventral part to move your musculature and that'll move your hand out of the way very quickly. So n normally, nociceptors will respond to very strong or high threshold stimuli. Now that means that if you just take your hand, right? Let's say you have your right hand in front of you. If you just touch your hand with your left hand, like your left index finger is touching your hand in different places, those nociceptors are not really going to be stimulated. Now if you were to take a needle, and please don't do this, but if you were to take a needle and puncture your hand, or if you were to put your hand uh, on a really hot surface, those nociceptors would be very stimulated and that would send a signal back to your spinal cord causing something like a reflex. Now different nociceptors are sensitive to different stimuli. So you can have thermal nociceptors. Uh, again, the hot stove would be an example of that. You can have mechanical nociceptors. Again, the example of the puncturing your hand with something is an example of that. And then you also have chemical nociceptors. So uh, pouring some type of acidic thing on your hand in a chemistry lab, um, that would be an example of that. So these receptors also respond to chemicals in our food. Okay. So do you guys know what chemical in foods can cause us to feel hot and get that spicy sensation? What is the chemical that leads to spicy foods? I'll give you guys a little bit to discuss and then come up with an answer. All right, so I hope you guys answered capsaicin. If not, don't worry, at least now you know. So capsaicin is that ingredient or that chemical that's present in something like cayenne pepper and other peppers, uh, which makes food very, very spicy. Um, now A is incorrect because cholesterol is actually uh, something that's found in animal products like whole eggs, um, butter, things like that, uh, whole milk. And that's actually a precursor to certain hormones like testosterone. It's actually really important. It lines the cells of... Um, of every cell in your body, so it's part of that l lipid bilayer, really important. Uh, vitamin C is incorrect, that's the stuff that you get from like orange juice, spinach, um, really important because we can no longer synthesize it, some prime apes, prime apes still can on their own. Um, gluten is actually a protein found in, in carbohydrate sources like, uh, for example, pizza. Uh, high gluten pizza is actually uh, my favorite. <laughs> Gluten as a protein adds to the elasticity of the carbohydrate. So uh, amino acids are actually the building, pro uh, building blocks of proteins. Um, so that's in everything that you eat that contains protein. So for example, eggs, chicken, beef, pork, etc. Now ketones are actually a byproduct of fat breakdown. Um, they can act as a secondary type of fuel for the brain. Um, you may, many of you might have heard of the ketogenic diet, for example. Uh, but these are a breakdown of fats. Uh, ketones can actually be very acidic in people who have type 1 diabetes, uh, but for people who are not diabetic, the ketogenic diets can potentially be useful in certain cases, for example, epilepsy. Now, triglycerides has to do with fats, and glycogen is sugar stored in your muscles and in your liver. Uh, so those are why those are incorrect. Capsaicin is the chemical that makes foods taste spicy. And why that's important for you guys is that the capsaicin will stimulate the nociceptors and it will make your brain interpret that what's in your mouth is, uh, is hot or spicy, uh, when in reality it isn't. It's just the chemical stimulating that receptor. Now, let's talk about prostaglandins. Now, prostaglandins enhance the sensitivity of receptors to pain, making you feel pain more intensely. And I can already see some of your faces like, ooh, those things are terrible, right? We don't like prostaglandins. But actually, this can be uh, very useful in understanding the world around us. Now, there are conditions like allodynia um, where prostaglandins act when they're really not supposed to. So uh, a person with this condition will get you know, touched by the, the tail of a dog or uh, by their friend and they'll feel uh, a lot of pain, even though the touch was actually very soft. Um, so this would be uh, an issue with that. Now, long-lasting injuries can actually lead to uh, a change that would cause someone to feel a lot of pain uh, via sensitive touch, and that's what would be allodynia. Now, the resulting state of hypersensitivity to pain is called neuropathic pain. Um, so neuropathy or neuropathic 
uh, means that a disease or disease state that's in reference to or in relation to a nerve or something neurological. Uh, and this is caused by the malfunctioning nervous system rather than an actual injury. Now, another neuropathic pain um, can come from diabetic neuropathy. So there are actually countless types of neuropathies. Uh, neuropathy, again, just means like a disease state of a nerve or multiple nerves. Um, so there's mononeuropathies, polyneuropathies. Usually mononeuropathies are, uh, deal with a, a very large nerve. An example of that would be uh, sciatica or, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome where there's compression of the nerve, uh, the median nerve in your form. But in the case of diabetic neuropathy, um, this is the case where the nerves of the hands or the feet are damaged um, because they're exposed to a large amount or a, li a high concentration of sugar in the blood. Um, this is usually uh, going to cause numbness, tingling, uh, but even burning and aching types of pain. Uh, and this is very common in other types of neuropathies as well. So in the case of sciatica, um, which is just numbness and tingling in the sciatic nerve, um, that's usually caused by a herniated disc at L5-S1. Um, that's going to lead to the back of your uh, butt and the back of your leg being kind of numb. In the case of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, then there'll be numbing in your wrist uh, and maybe even pain near the wrist area. Okay, but diabetic neuropathy is a key one that was highlighted in the Brain Facts book. Now, let's talk about sending and receiving messages. So, a question for you guys. Are all axons myelinated? And if not, which ones are and which ones are not? And why? What are the differences? Why would one type of axon be myelinated but not the other? I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to discuss and come up with an answer. So hopefully you guys answered that not all axons are myelinated. So there are different kinds of uh, axons. There's different types of uh, cells that myelinate. So remember that in your central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes. These oligodendrocytes can actually myelinate multiple nerve axons or nerve fibers, whereas Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system can only myelinate a single axon in a single place. Um, now on top of that, most of the axons, or I can give you an example, and if you remember from the motor presentation, uh, we gave you guys a picture. So the uh, motor nerves usually are heavily myelinated, and they're usually the thickest in diameter. And the reason for that is that motor signals have to be sent very, very quickly. Uh, this is what gives us reflexes that are very fast. It's what gives us the ability to play sports at high levels and, and react to external stimuli that might be dangerous. Um, so you can go back to that example of putting your hand on a hot stove. So the signal of putting your hand on a hot stove um, sends a sensory signal all the way to your spinal cord via those nociceptors and those uh, nerve uh, sensory receptors in your hand. And then from the spinal cord, that spinal cord is going to send out a uh, efferent signal, a motor signal to the musculature, and that's going to cause you to move your arm out of the way. Um, so that has to be very quickly. Not only does it have to be very quickly, but you don't even have to go all the way up to the brain to interpret it. All you got to do is go to the spinal cord and out. Now, those are A alpha fibers um, that innervate muscles, for example. But we also have other fibers like C or A delta fibers. A delta fibers are going to be uh, very loosely myelinated. They're almost not myelinated at all. And those are going to deal with uh, pain and touch, for example. Now, C-type fibers are also going to be uh, pain, touch, and those are going to be what, how you feel more of a dull type of pain. The myelinated axons uh, that have to do with pain and touch uh, will feel a lot sharper of a type of pain because it's a lot quicker. Now, once these signals actually make it to the spinal cord, they're going to go up through what's called an ascending pathway, which again means to rise or to go up make its way to the thalamus and then into the primary somatosensory cortex, which is Brodmann areas 3, 1, and 2, or which are Brodmann areas 3, 1, and 2. Now, from there, those signals are relayed to other parts of the cortex, which helps you monitor the state of your body um, and then can transform the sensations you're feeling into a conscious experience. Um, so this is how you become aware of your surroundings. 
Now, because of this, and because of our ability to interpret signals, we actually have the ability to make something new of the signal and interpret the signal differently. Um, so you can change the way you respond to something. You might not be able to change the way you feel from something, but you might be able to change the way you respond to that stimulus. And this is where that idea of sensory adaptation comes back into circle. So if you expose yourself to a certain stimuli over time, you will get better at it. Um, so an example of this would be taking uh, an ice bath. Ice baths have been used in athletics and sports and all this stuff for so long. Um, and the reason for that is, is that it's very good, for one, for recovery, good for your immune system. But two, um, many of you guys have probably never taken an ice bath and probably don't like taking cold showers. Um, and the reason for that is that it can be kind of painful at first. But the more you do it and the more you expose yourself to cold temperatures, the better your body will adapt to that temperature. And so that's where sensory adaptation comes into play. And that's how you can change your response to a specific stimuli. Now, let's talk about pain management. So our bodies have natural ways of dealing with pain. So once the pain signal actually reaches your cortex, uh, the signal will be interpreted and then a descending pathway uh, will be sent, or a signal will be sent via a descending pathway that's gonna help modulate the pain. Um, these ne networks of signals are actually gonna release something called endorphins, which some of you may have heard of before. Um, many of you guys have heard of something like the runner's high, where if you go for a long run, you eventually start to feel very, very good. And that's because you're releasing endorphins. Um, and endorphins are just op opioids that are produced by the body. Um, so they act like morphine. Uh, that's going to numb you a little bit. Now, adrenaline can also act as a pain suppressor. Um, and I'm sure many of you guys have had some type of experience. So I'll share one of my experiences with you guys. So when I was your age, I was playing uh, high school basketball. And I was on the varsity team, and I was actually put in charge of uh, the summer training camp for our, uh, you know, next year's players for JV and varsity. And my coach gave me a set of, of workouts to do. And we had these benches that were made of concrete outside in the, in the courtyard of, of our high school. And we were using them as um, tools to jump on, and, uh, you know, we were, we were using the benches as a, as a workout tool. Anyway, what ended up happening was that I slipped a little bit and I was doing an exercise incorrectly and my shin, my right shin scraped very hard against the concrete uh, bench and it sliced open the anterior part of my lower leg uh, to the point that you could see the bone and you could see a little bit of the interosseous membrane. It was a very deep gash. Uh, but I didn't know that I had the gash. I just knew that I scraped my leg against the, the concrete. And anyway, I brushed it off. I had a lot of adrenaline going. I, we had been working out for at least 30 to 40 minutes by then. And so I kept going. And then one of my teammates says, oh, Sebastian, you're, uh, you're, you're bleeding. And I just kind of looked down and there was a lot of blood. <laughs> and I, had, I did not feel a thing. Um, and, and so I ended up having to go to the hospital, to the emergency room to get staples put in. Um, and even that... Uh, they didn't give me any drugs to numb the pain. Now, I can tell you the staples definitely did hurt. <laughs> the injury didn't hurt at all, uh, but the, the staples did, and then it started to get sore afterwards. Uh, so adrenaline can be very good at numbing pain. Now, the sensitivity to pain is actually dependent on person to person. It'll depend on the receptors a person has, so that is dependent on their genetics and embryology. Um, and these endorphins or these opioids that we naturally make are actually going to work by intercepting the signal before it gets either to the spinal cord or before it gets to the brain. So if you have uh, an injury or you're going into surgery, for example, the one of the ways that we numb an area is by sending these chemicals into the area, uh, for example, in the spinal cord, which is going to block the nerves from sending signals. And that's how you go numb uh, before a surgery. Now, there are different treatment methods for pain. So, for example, meditation is well known to reduce pain. Uh, hypnosis can. I don't know too much about hypnosis, but um, it was listed in the Brain Facts book. Uh, massages can help. So, one of the things that's very popular nowadays are little massage gun tools. So, you have this little handheld device, uh, a little bit larger than your average cell phone, and 
they basically hit you uh, wherever you put it. It's basically a little a tool that's a vibrating hammer. Think of a shake weight, but with a little nozzle at the end. And these tools, or that hammer, is used to give you a little massage. And that massage is actually going to end up causing uh, a very small amount of damage, which is going to dilate your blood vessels. And it's going to bring blood into the area uh, which you're hitting. Uh, and so bringing blood into the area is actually one way to relieve pain because now you're getting nutrients, you're getting endorphins into that area. Uh, and so it's very popular among bodybuilders and professional athletes to get these types of massages, something like acupuncture or uh, cupping, if you've ever seen that before. Um, they all kind of work within the same mechanisms. Um, another method is uh, CBT. So cognitive behavioral therapy is actually super widely used in other things. So for example, in the treatment of PTSD uh, for uh, veterans, uh, for victims of some type of traumatic event. Um, and it goes again with the idea of sensory adaptation. So cognitive behavioral therapy is trying to expose people to certain stimuli uh, to very similar or uh, exact of exactly the same stimuli that a person received that caused the uh, the trauma, and so for example, here at UCF we have uh, a VA psychological uh, center in the psychology building, and we also work very closely with the VA at the near the College of Medicine, and they have a lot of veterans that come and they give them CBT, and one of the ways that they do this is by using something like an Oculus Rift, which is a, a VR headset style. Um, using, they use a VR headset, they use uh, headphones to emulate the same sounds of warfare, and they even use smells. Because remember that your smell and what you hear uh, are gonna help form memories. And so they will expose the person to smells of gunpowder, smells of sand and heat, uh, and the, their tools that they were using. Uh, so they expose them to similar smells, similar sounds, and similar visual stimuli in order to get their sensory system to adapt and to no longer see that stimulus as a threat. And so that's what cognitive behavioral therapy is like in one sense. There are other uses, um, not just PTSD, but super, super useful to know. Um, so cannabis, so actually marijuana uh, can actually reduce pain. And right now we don't actually fully understand how that works, um, but we do know that it, it is very good at relieving some stress and some type of pain, usually emotional type of pain. Um, but it could be working by suppressing a couple of areas that are associated with this emotion or with the pain. Um, and that usually has something to do with the limbic system. So the limbic system uh, is very responsible for uh, our primal instincts of, of eating and, and uh, fear. So I'm sure we've all heard of the amygdala before. Uh, and so that's one of the ways that cannabis works is by modulating these areas now i have a question for you guys so question number one is what nerve is responsible for sending visual light signals to the occipital lobe of the brain so this is a question regarding our sensory systems so option a is olfactory nerve optic uh, option b is the optic nerve option c is suboccipital nerve and then option d is the facial nerve i'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer this one So, if you answered B for the optic nerve, you'd be correct. So, olfactory is your first cranial nerve. And that first cranial nerve comes from the, the cerebrum. And it sits on something called the cribriform plate, which is just at the top of your nose, at the base of your skull. And that's going to have to do with smell, because it's in your nose. Um, and that has to do with olfaction, hence olfactory nerve. B is the optic nerve. That goes through the optic canal in your skull. And that's going to be what sends the signal of the visual stimuli to your occipital lobe. The suboccipital nerve is actually a nerve uh, in the back. Um, so there's a, a group of muscles called the suboccipital triangle. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get too deep into that anatomy, but it's a nerve that, that surrounds those muscles and goes through them um, in the, the back of your head, basically. But it's very superficial. And then D is the facial nerve. The facial nerve is cranial nerve 7. It's both sensory and motor and it's going to innervate the muscles of your face, which give off the facial expression muscles. So the reason that you can smile, uh, laugh, frown, uh, raise your eyebrow, uh, and look at a person weird is because of the facial nerve. The facial nerve also innervates the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, 
Uh, so that's uh, super important. Now, question number two for you guys. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by two things. So what two things do we know about Alzheimer's disease? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to discuss and then pick an answer. All right. So Alzheimer's disease is characterized by beta amyloid plaques as well as neurofibrillary tangles. So Alzheimer's uh, is a neurodegenerative disease that's progressive. And two things that you can find in someone who has Alzheimer's is beta amyloid plaques, which are little, uh, they're basically uh, proteins that accumulate and they aggregate together and, and form big clumps. And these are outside of the cell. So these are outside of the neurons. Now, neurofibrillary tangles have to do with a protein called tau, T-A-U. And though that protein is actually normal in our neurons, it, it helps forms, uh, form the cytoskeleton in our neurons, uh, but it can be toxic, and that's intracellular, so that's within the cell itself. Let's move on to question three. So the name for the sensory receptors of pain and touch are what? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer this one. So the answer is nociceptors. Okay, so cell receptors are very, very broad. Uh, mechanoreceptors are going to sense me mechanical tension in the cells of your of your skin, but they're not necessarily going to be uh, painful. Um, nociceptors are the correct answer. Option D is the no-go receptor. Uh, no-go receptor or no-go 66 is a is um, something that's expressed by oligodendrocytes um, that doesn't let axons regrow. Uh, and then E are thermoreceptors. And thermoreceptors are just the sensation of temperature, not necessarily pain and touch. Okay, so question number four. ALS is... So go ahead and take a look at the answer choices and go ahead and tell me what ALS is. All right, so ALS is a disease that affects the voluntary and involuntary muscles. Remember that ALS uh, stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and it's going to be a, a disease that only affects motor neurons, so it's not going to affect cognition, or in other words, the, it's not going to affect a person's ability to think, just their ability to talk to their muscles. Now, question number five, and this is the last one. What is the LGN? Uh, multiple answers may apply here. So this is a select all that apply type of question. So you're more than welcome to pick two or three or four or all of the options. Okay, so the answer to question number five. The correct answers are A, B, and D. So C and E are incorrect. So the lateral geniculate nucleus is a nucleus in the thalamus. So it's a relay center within the thalamus, so that's option B. It's going to receive input from the optic nerve, so this is part of the optic pathway. So A is correct. And then D obviously is the name, so the lateral geniculate nucleus. Now, option C says a structure within the spinal cord. The thalamus is not within the spinal cord. The thalamus is part of the diencephalon, which is uh, uh, above the midbrain. It is within the cerebrum. And then option E says important in touch sensation. And that's not true because the sense of touch is going to go through other nuclei. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Please keep studying uh, the previous lectures and make sure that you know stuff really, really well if you want to do well in the competition. I hope you guys are enjoying these um, and have a great rest of your day.